Society builders paved the way to a better world, to a better day. A united approach to building a new society. Join a conversation for social transformation. Society builders. Society builders with your host, Dwayne Veron. Welcome to Society Builders, and thanks for joining the conversation for social transformation. In our last episode, we explored the definition of discourse, exploring both what it should and should not look like from a Baha'i perspective. Here, we focused on five key characteristics. Our approach should be unifying, consultative, uplifting, principled, and constructive. Now that we have a better sense of what discourse is, or at least what it should be, we now need to explore further how to best engage with such discourse. And that's the theme we're going to focus on today. So today, we explore the art of engaging with the prevalent discourses of society. Now, we engage with discourse on many levels, some informal and some formal. We engage both as individuals as well as communities. It might be conversations we have with friends or colleagues at work, or it might be a more systematic dialogue we engage in with a community of like-minded people centered around a particular issue. Those same five qualities we explored in our last episode should apply no matter what the context and setting is that we're talking about here. But as we decide to more formally engage with a specific discourse, there are probably different stages we need to go through to most effectively apply our teachings. And so today, we're going to explore five different stages, which I believe we probably need to go through as we engage in discourse at a more formal level. These five stages are first, deciding which discourse to engage with. Second, getting ourselves familiar with that discourse. Third, then turning to our writings and the experiences of the Baha'i community to explore how our teachings shed new light on the problems providing a focus for that discourse. Then fourth, sharing these teachings and insights with the community of that discourse in ways that they will best understand and welcome. And finally, reflecting and adjusting, essentially a continuous iterative cycle of action and reflection. So with that background, let's dive in and grapple with these different stages that we should go through as we work to engage with the prevalent discourses of society. One of the greatest outcomes of the previous plans is that we've learned to prioritize. Now, we better understand that as communities, we have limited resources. And so consequently, we have to make strategic decisions about how to best focus those resources. Now, Baha'u'llah tells us to be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. Wow, how exciting, right? But it's easy to feel overwhelmed by just how many problems surround us. And they all seem so pressing and important. So clearly, you and I, we're not going to be able to address all of the world's problems. So how do we go about prioritizing, deciding which discourses we choose to engage with? Now, there are a variety of considerations we should weigh when deciding how to prioritize. There are different reasons why we might be considering engaging with a particular discourse. Perhaps most common, we'll engage with specific discourses because we're responding to something someone asks us. We might have a friend or a colleague, it might be our office chatter, but people are often concerned with the problems of the world, and they may turn to us to either solicit our views or maybe to ask what the Baha'i perspective is on the issue. 
So here, really, we don't have much of a choice. We have to respond as best we can. So our engagement is a response to a demand. And by the way, I believe that increasingly society will demand this of us. So we'll see this kind of response necessitated at a more formal level as well. Similar to that experience I shared in episode one, where the University of Texas turned to us in the midst of a race crisis seeking our help. That's discourse you just have to respond to. Or next, we might choose to engage in a discourse associated with our particular profession or field of study. Now, the level of opportunity for us here varies considerably by profession and by the circumstances of our particular opportunities. On one level, all professions have opportunities around how they do their work, primarily around their work culture, their professional ethic, how they interact with management, etc. So across all fields, there are some common opportunities here. But for some professions, there are even greater opportunities because these professions intersect with society building more directly. The Universal House of Justice calls out people working in the peace arena, for example. Similarly, your career may see you interacting with issues associated with race unity, with education, the environment, media, mental health, human rights, or any of a range of other social issues. So here there are even more opportunities for engaging with discourses within these specific professional fields. Now, we should comment on those training for their futures as well, because the opportunities available to you while you're in college or university are probably some of the best opportunities you'll ever have. I mean, universities are hotbeds of discourse. There are probably opportunities in university to engage with just about every discourse topic under the sun. Or it could be that you choose to engage with a social discourse simply on the basis of your personal passions. Often a very particular issue speaks to us, so to speak. It stands out in our consciousness. We find ourselves thinking about it and wanting to make a difference. And we need to increasingly learn to listen to this voice of our conscious. It empowers us to engage with the discourse that we're most passionate about. And if this is the path we're on, then we'll probably want to find communities of like-minded people also tackling this issue. And there are literally thousands of organizations out there for us to potentially collaborate with. And as our engagement in such discourse deepens and grows, we may want to collaborate with others in building a Baha'i-inspired organization specifically focused on contributing to this discourse. Now, beyond our personal passions, we often engage with a particular discourse because of the strategic needs of our clusters or neighborhoods. Our intensive campaigns, for example, may focus on particular groups of people. We may find ourselves intersecting with school communities, eager to find paths of being of service to them. Or it may be that there are specific obstacles inhibiting the participation of the communities that we're trying to interact with here. Challenges around education, health, or even social barriers that divide people. And we may need to address such matters as part of what the Universal House of Justice refers to as dimensions of a single unified, outward-looking endeavor carried out at the grassroots of society. All these efforts are pursued according to a common framework for action. And this, above all else, brings coherence to the overall pattern of activity. Wow. So we'll see both personal initiatives and communal action as driving forces in the decisions we ultimately make in prioritizing the discourses we choose to engage with. Once we've made the decision to engage in a particular discourse, our immediate challenge is one of getting ourselves up to speed, so to speak, familiarizing ourselves with that discourse. This is part of a larger process that the Universal House of Justice frames 
as our capacity to read society, to perceive patterns in the actions and dialogues that surround us. Now, reading society is a skill. And I'm not talking here about any specific discourse. I'm talking about the ability to discern with wisdom, to see key patterns, draw insights, and deeply familiarize yourself with any discourse. Now, the Universal House of Justice frequently encourages us to apply the methods of science to our initiatives. And in this context, this might look like what academics refer to as a literature review, the starting point for any scientific inquiry. When you study for your PhD, for example, this is a big part of the skill that you develop, the ability to read and draw insights from a body of literature. It's a skill. When I was studying for my PhD, for example, we had to read about 600 pages a week so that we developed mastery over the discipline across a range of subfields. It's not just about the actual reading of the articles. It's about becoming familiar with the larger debates within which such articles are situated, developing literacy around the meaning of their key constructs, being able to weigh and evaluate research designs and findings. I mean, there's a lot to it. Now, it'd be great if we could apply this kind of review to the subjects we want to master, but realistically, most of us probably don't have the time and commitment at that level. So we need to explore approaches which are more accessible and realistic to our circumstances. So let's explore some easier options here. Now, every discourse will have its literature. One of our first challenges is locating that literature. In some cases, that'll take the form of actual scholarly literature, articles appearing in academic journals, for example. But academics don't own discourse. Discourse is often most stimulating at the grassroots level. So beyond peer-reviewed journals, there are other outlets, popular books that are easier to read, social media sites, podcasts, and even events like local meetings for groups committed to the issues surrounding a discourse. So diving in and exploring the literature is your first step. You might start your review by searching for articles associated with the issue, but as you dive deeper, you'll start to figure out who some of the key luminaries in that discourse are. Then start hunting for interviews or articles where they feature. So finding key people to listen to is a great step here. Try to tease out the specific issues which people engaged in the discourse are most concerned with. Explore the types of problems and solutions which they're grappling with. Pay particular attention to their vocabulary. Look for key words, key constructs that take on very specific meaning within the discourse. So try to become proficient in their vocabulary. Let me give you an example here to clarify what I mean by vocabulary. Imagine that you had only recently discovered the Baha'i Faith and that you were eager to get literate in its language. There are key concepts that you would encounter, like Baha'is would say things like progressive revelation, and you'd need to understand what that means. I mean, it's something very specific. There's a whole system of meaning behind that construct. So in a similar way, we need to get ourselves educated in the language of the discourse to understand its key vocabulary. And similarly, we need to be on the lookout for what I call a discourse's minefields. These are hot button issues that you want to avoid because they often mean something very different within the discourse, which might result and very negative perceptions of you if you step into them without understanding their proper meaning. Let me give you an example of what I mean here by minefield. Let's say that you are interacting in a discourse associated with a group that is grappling with race unity. And within that group, someone says, Black Lives Matter. That construct means something very specific within this discourse. It recognizes that African Americans are often specifically targeted for prejudicial conduct on the basis of their race in ways which differ from how others are impacted. It's a construct that has a whole deep dialogue that goes behind it. 
But let's say you're not really acquainted with all of that. And at some point, you decide with the purest of motives, of course, to explain how all lives matter, not just black lives. Boom! You just stepped on a mine. And that will shape perceptions of you, which will color your interaction within that discourse. You're burning bridges before you've even built them. Now, I understand your intent here. You mean to promote the concept of the oneness of humanity. But what you don't understand is that within that particular discourse, saying all lives matter is saying that you don't recognize that there are unique problems associated with how African Americans are treated. You are unintentionally negating the black experience. So becoming aware of these minefields is critical so that you can engage in discourse with wisdom. None of this precludes you from contributing. You just need to first get literate so you can engage with discernment, so you understand the minefields you're walking through. And finally, we can work towards becoming more conversant in a discourse by interacting and networking with people already within that discourse. You learn from others already engaged, seeking their accompaniment, accompaniment which they're often eager to offer. And as you build networks, those you interact with will introduce you to others, other people with knowledge around specific issues where your journey takes you. And little by little, you'll find yourself growing from becoming only basically familiar to soon mastering the contours of a discourse. Okay, so now we're conversant in a discourse. We've learned their vocabulary. We understand the issues. We're sensitive to their needs. Now that we understand it, it's time to better understand our potential contributions to this discourse. And where do we get that substance? By diving into our writings, of course. And so immersing ourselves in the writings is really key. It's where we will discover the teachings that apply to the problems we've unsurfaced. We can also explore the experiences of Baha'i communities worldwide. And I think we're going to see lots of new resources emerging to help us with this particular kind of opportunity. So we search for insights and experiences to bring to the party. But remember, our contributions are not just about the ideas we share. They're also about processes like consultation and qualities like humility. These are things we also bring to the table. Now, our starting point here is to first get ourselves trained in this art of better engaging with discourse. And here, the institute process is key. First and foremost, of course, we have Ruhi Book 14, which specifically trains us in engaging with discourse. This helps give us the general skills that we can apply across different discourses. So book 14 is our starting point. And if you're in college or university, you have access to additional training in this arena through the courses of the Institute for the Study of Global Prosperity through ISGP. But what's particularly exciting, I think, is that over time, we'll see many Institute resources evolve. And your early experiences with different discourses may actually help in the development of new curricula along these lines. But until we have these branch courses training us for specific issues, there's a challenge in navigating through a discourse without the benefit of that more formal training. So while the Institute process is our main tool for getting training here, and it's something that will evolve considerably in the near future, in the immediate future, we'll probably have to simply dive in and do our best here. And I'd like to hope that this podcast series can also act as a resource for you. That's certainly my hope and aspiration. In future episodes, we'll explore different discourses around topics like how to bring antagonistic groups together, race unity, spiritual parenting, media responsibility, and a host of other discourse arenas. 
So hopefully, this podcast can also help familiarize you with the discourse, helping ground you in the issues, the vocabulary, and sharing insights from its leading luminaries. Well, that's the hope anyway. And if nothing else, it might just give you a little sample of what that discourse is really about. So stay tuned. There's a lot for us to discover in this journey together. Okay, so you've become familiar with the literature of a discourse. You now understand how the Baha'i teachings and experiences might apply. Your next challenge is to figure out how to share it with the community of that discourse in ways that they will understand and welcome. In fact, the Universal House of Justice refers to this need to deepen your understanding of the teachings of the cause so that you will be able to apply them to the problems of individuals and society and explain them to your peers in ways that they will understand and welcome. So that's our challenge. How do we share these insights in ways that people will understand and welcome? How can we best make our messages hearable? It's not about what we have to say. It's about what people hear, what they ultimately take away. A friend of mine used to say, you can give them the message, but that doesn't mean they're going to get the message. So this is what we have to get good at, figuring out how to make it accessible and receptive and how to remove obstacles that might prevent people from properly weighing our contributions. Now this, I believe, speaks to our style, the ability to elevate the atmosphere in which we move. Remember, this is what we talked about in our last episode. When you bring divine qualities to a discourse, humility, enthusiasm, forbearance, wisdom, trustworthiness, when you rise above self-interest, show loyalty, honesty, and the like, when you bring these virtues to the table, it makes it easier for people to listen to you because they want to listen to you. And by way of contrast, if people think you always speak to promote your own interest, or if you're arrogant speaking down to people like you think you're better than them, I mean, even if you say the most brilliant thing, people will be arguing with you in their heads. You're making them defensive. You're making it much, much harder for them to listen and evaluate what you're saying. You're getting in the way of your message. So this is how our qualities are also a part of the equation. Living divine qualities makes our message more hearable. And I want to also put in a plug for friendship here. We should become close friends with the people we interact with in a discourse, not just in the formal spaces of that discourse, but also in the informal spaces of our lives. Now, I'm not saying you should be friends so that people are more receptive to what you have to say, although I do think that's a natural consequence. I'm saying that friendship should be the normal manner in which we engage with anyone, whether at work and discourse or in other areas of our lives. Friendship is a big part of us building the unity of the human race. And this is truly one of the best gifts we receive here. Many of the deepest and most meaningful friendships in our lives will be formed in the discourses we engage with, just like the friendships we form in our associations within our Baha'i communities. So this is truly something to cherish and look forward to. Engaging with discourse is not dull, academic, and dry. It's an exciting opportunity to forge new friendships, friendships that will add considerably to our quality of life. And our final stage in engaging with discourse is reflection. I don't want us to think of this as a linear sequence. It's more circular. We act, we reflect, we act, we reflect. It's like breathing. You inhale, you exhale, you act, you reflect. It's an iterative process where we're reflecting with a view to improving our participation 
and then evaluating anew to see how to further improve our participation. Now, this kind of reflection shouldn't be limited to the spaces in our minds. Ideally, there should be others that we can consult with, perhaps other Baha'is who are joining with us in our journey of interacting within a discourse and with the community of the discourse itself. It's important to consult and give expression to your reflection. And reflection isn't just about our ability to improve our own participation. It's also about empowering others to learn from our experiences, potentially even contributing to the development of new training materials. And it's important to consult with Baha'i institutions along the way, not only as a powerful resource to help us when we encounter challenges in our journeys, but also to help our institutions evolve in their capacity to grapple with such issues and to learn from our encounters. This is particularly important in this society building arena where Baha'i institutions will also be evolving dramatically as they come to better understand their potential role and contributions in cultivating such initiative. So reflection plays a key role in the continuous adaptation of our engagement. But I also want to strike a more somber note here. Such reflection will, at times, require us to evaluate whether our continued engagement makes sense or whether it would be wiser for us to disengage with the discourse or community, particularly if it becomes too political or toxic. Here, I'm thinking of the example of Abdu'l-Bahá that we explored in episode eight, where Baha'is in Iran were instrumental in the rise of Iran's first democratic institutions and its first constitution. Some of Iran's new institutions were even being called houses of justice, a clear reflection of the Baha'i influence here. You can imagine that this must have felt exhilarating for the Baha'is in Iran who had championed such reforms for over two decades. But with success on the horizon, the political reforms became divisive, ultimately leading, in fact, to a civil war. And it was in this context that Abdul Baha instructed the Baha'is in Iran to completely disengage with the political reform process and instead turn their energy to social reform, resulting in that amazing network of over 60 schools we discussed in episodes 9 and 10. And the Baha'is in Iran almost universally responded with absolute obedience, and they disengaged completely from Iran's political reforms. Now, you can imagine that this would have been hard for them emotionally, and you can imagine how disorienting this would have been for others in society who looked to the example of the Baha'is. But Abdu'l Baha weighed the costs and determined that the costs were too great, that it had become a divisive movement. And so the difficult decision was made to disengage and re-engage elsewhere. And though less dramatic, we'll sometimes be faced with a similar dilemma. Is what we're working on too divisive, too toxic to merit our continued efforts. This shouldn't be a cop-out option. After all, perseverance is a quality we bring to discourse. So it's not about it being too tough. It's about its effect. And so on rare occasions, exceptions to the rule really, we may need to resort to disengaging with discourse, empowering us to invest our energies elsewhere. Again, it's a last resort, but it's part of what we're weighing in our reflection. So like breathing, we act, we reflect, we act, we reflect, working to continuously improve our participation in discourse. Now, the Universal House of Justice frames our engagement with discourse as a skill. And I hope that in today's episode, you can see how at each stage, we need to develop and perfect our skills. Skills for first, prioritizing, so that we focus our very limited resources 
on the discourses that are most meaningful and important. Second, learning to read society, getting ourselves familiar and confident with the discourses we engage with. Third, learning how to apply our teachings, the essence really of Baha'i scholarship. Fourth, learning to communicate those teachings and experiences in ways people will ultimately understand and welcome. And fifth, continuously reflecting and adjusting our engagement, potentially even necessitating as a last resort that we should disengage, particularly if the discourse has become too divisive or toxic. And remember, the Institute process and Baha'i institutions are there to support us along the way. So with that, let's engage. Let's engage with the prevalent discourses of our society. Now, next time we start a new sequence of episodes that I'm incredibly excited about. Now that we have explored discourse at a higher level, we can finally dive in and start engaging with specific discourses. And we're going to kick this all off with what I think is the granddaddy of them all. The December 30th, 2021 message of the Universal House of Justice, our, our mandate in society building, highlights one specific issue that we might want to prioritize in our society building endeavors. And that's working to bring antagonistic groups together. They tell us that as we work across different cultures and social environments, we must assist the friends to face new challenges, including helping previously antagonistic groups find unity through pursuit of a common goal. Well, in all honesty, I can't think of anything in the discourse arena more challenging than that. When I first read this, I was blown away. I mean, clearly, in this highly polarized day and age, perhaps now more than ever, this is one of the most pressing issues facing society. But wow, it sounds so challenging. It's such a tall order. So there's a lot for us to learn here. So remember, once we've decided to tackle a specific discourse, our next challenge is to familiarize ourselves with it. Now you're in luck here. For much of the rest of the year, we're going to hear from the world's top academics and practitioners engaged in this discourse around how to bring antagonistic groups together. And trust me, you're going to be amazed by how much we're going to learn together. By the end of that sequence, you'll be much better prepared in this art of depolarizing, knowing what works and what doesn't. So in my next episode, I'll kick this all off with my interview with award-winning journalist, Amanda Ripley. Now, Amanda is author of the best-selling book, High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. Now, I would highly encourage you to read her book. I think it's the starting point for any study on how to bring antagonistic groups together. Amanda does an amazing job at summarizing the research around depolarization, but what makes the book absolutely riveting is the story she weaves around that research, traveling all over the world, even into the jungles of Colombia, where she interviews FARC rebels as part of her narrative. And what's most incredible, perhaps, is that Amanda discovers the faith while writing her book and holds it up as the model, the only large-scale community model doing this business right. In fact, she argues that if social scientists created a religion, it would be the Baha'i faith. So you'll want to hang on to every word she shares. It's an amazing interview, a real treat, a great way for us to launch into this sequence of interviews. And Amanda is just the start of our journey. In the weeks that follow, we're going to hear from the world's leading authorities in this discourse. Trust me, these are interviews you really won't want to miss. So thanks again for joining me today in our conversation for social transformation. I look forward to seeing you again next time on 
Society Builders. Society Builders paved the way to a better world, to a better day. A united approach to building a new society. There's a crisis facing humanity. People suffer from a lack of unity. It's time for a better path to a new society. Join a conversation. A social transformation. Society Builders. Join a conversation. A social transformation. Society Builders. So engage with your local communities and explore the exciting possibilities. We can elevate the atmosphere in which we move. The paradigm is shifting. It's so very uplifting. It's a new beat, a new song, a brand new groove. Join a conversation, a social transformation, society builder. The social transformation, society builders. The Baha'i faith has a lot to say, helping people discover a better way with discourse and social action framed by unity. Now the time has come to lift the game and apply the teachings of the greatest name and rise to meet the glory of our destiny. Join a conversation, a social transformation, society builders. Join a conversation, a social transformation, society builders.